Welcome to today's Danfoss webinar, Key Points for Proper Refrigerant Charging, hosted by Jamie Kitchen. My name is Michael Beckerman, and I will be your moderator. During this 60-minute session, Jamie will show you how to maximize your investment by ensuring that the proper superheat and subcooling charging required in higher efficiency systems is performed for optimal system performance. Webinar attendees are muted, but I encourage you to submit your questions into the chat box found in the GoToWebinar module. We will answer a select number of your submissions at the conclusion of this session. Lastly, this webinar will be recorded and available on demand at a later date. Subscribe to the Danfoss YouTube channel at Danfoss Cool US to view that recording. Well, let's get started. I am pleased to introduce the presenter for this webinar, Jamie Kitchen, Danfoss Engineer. Jamie has over 30 years of experience with mechanical systems, 20 of which have been with Danfoss and the HVACR industry. Jamie, take it away. Thank you, Michael. Just to get started here when it pops up on my screen, presentation. Um, as Michael laid out, uh, high efficiency systems in particular um, really rely on a correct refrigerant charge. And by correct refrigerant charge, I'm referring to charging according to the manufacturer's recommendation. So there's two key points to system efficiency. In other words, really they're the underlying foundation that um, determines how well a system performs. There's lots of them, but there's two key ones. One is airflow, and the other one is probably refrigerant charge. And they're in that order. The reason I put airflow first is because if your airflow is incorrect, nothing else really matters because nothing is going to have a correct value. You can use whatever charts, the most accurate equipment, whatever. If your airflow is incorrect, nothing else matters. On top of that, the refrigerant charge determines key parameters or the value of key parameters in a system and these control the absorption and rejection of heat and in order for the system to operate as designed these exchanges of heat have to happen at certain points a certain temperature difference between the air for example and this is really the underlying factor that or the the, the one variable that you can control your indirect control of is refrigerant charging so let's get started and we'll move through it. So HVAC systems require refrigerant in there as their lifeblood. It is the refrigerant that absorbs and rejects heat by changing state. And so when you have the correct amount of refrigerant, the refrigerant is boiling out the correct pressure and temperature, and you are running out of liquid or vapor at the correct distance towards the outlet of the coil so you have proper superheat and subcooling and you're not operating at a too high or too low of a temperature which reduces efficiency so one of the issues we really got to face these days is the lack of proper charging over half the systems out there and i'm not making this up have grossly overcharged systems they also have incorrect airflow. The two go hand in hand, surprisingly enough, even though they're the two most important factors, but it tells you something. You really can't control the size of the coil when you buy it, right? You don't have a coil stretcher or a shrinker, but one of the things you do have is you have the ability to charge in the correct way. So this is a really important step that's fully under your control that you can do that will really determine how well, not only will the system perform, but also, you don't end up with flooded compressors, poor lubrication, failed compressors, as you see in the chart below. So a correct charge or adding refrigerant or adjusting charge is one of those things that falls under, is it really necessary? So after you've charged the system, obviously you need refrigerant in it, but if you, take a measurement and you see something that indicates, say, a low evaporator pressure, unless you verify through certain steps, and this is exactly the point of this presentation today, unless you verify that, in fact, you need refrigerant, adding refrigerant is essentially going to end up with a result that you did not anticipate. And it is probably going to be a poorer result. And a lot of times you can end up with excess condensing pressure, flooded evaporators and compressors, all kinds of issues. 
So if you're just going to um, quickly ascertain a, uh, say, evaporator pressure, oh, I got low evaporator pressure, without, you know, looking at any other part of the system, and you add refrigerant, if it's not a refrigerant charge, and it probably isn't, then you are actually going to increase the problem rather than correct it. And so you will not be bringing any value to the table. So what you need to do is you need to find, once again, like we talked about last time, the root cause of the problem. If you need to add refrigerant to a system, you gotta ask yourself why. Was it undercharged to begin with? Maybe, but you really should also be taking a look at pressure testing and leak testing that system to make sure that you know, whatever the, the 20 ounces of refrigerant that happened to be missing, that, you know, they leaked out over the last year and a half, there's no point putting refrigerant in until you fix that leak, all right? Because again, the system will be operating most of the time undercharged. And we know undercharged systems operate with higher compressor temperatures, poor oil lubrication, and much shorter compressor life expectancy. So, once again, make sure that you have eliminated all other possible causes before you add refrigerant. And the same rule goes for adjusting superheat or replacing a component or taking any other action on a system. Make sure that you have isolated the root cause and deal with that rather than just jumping on the first thing and possibly making a mistake that can have very expensive repercussions down the road. Okay. So again, here is a basic system. When you first start a technical school in HVAC-R, they'll show you this four box diagram or four component diagram. And you'll see you have an expansion valve, an evaporator, compressor, and condenser. The low pressure, low temperature side designed to absorb heat is on the left in blue. The high temperature, high pressure side designed to reject the heat that the evaporator absorbs as well as the work the compressor adds is on the right. This expansion valve is in there to maintain that pressure difference and to meter refrigerant at the correct pressure and temperature, and in the case of an expansion valve like a TXV, at the correct amount based on the load. So here we have a straightforward example calculating superheat. We measure a pressure of 18 PSIG. We have R134A. And if you look at a pressure temperature chart or an app on your phone, you'll come up with 20 degrees Fahrenheit. That means the refrigerant changes state at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. In this case, it is boiling because it's absorbing heat. It is colder than the surroundings, so it is a heat sink. And you're going to continue to boil that liquid off until such time as you run out of liquid, the 100% vapor point in the evaporator. At this point, there's no more liquid to change state. So you sensibly heat the refrigerant as it absorbs heat in the rest of the evaporator circuit before it leaves. So superheat and subcooling are key parameters that you are going to utilize when charging. So if you are undercharged, you end up with not enough liquid to properly fill the evaporator. This means that you end up running out of liquid sooner in the evaporator, which means that the refrigerant vapor then just simply heats up a few degrees or 10 or 20 or 30 degrees before it leaves, it's really not absorbing a lot of heat. So you are underutilizing the evaporator. This is my, what happens when I say you don't have enough refrigerant to match the load. And you'll see the result as we go on. In the condenser, same situation, it is a heat transfer coil. In this case, the refrigerant is hotter than the air. So you are giving up heat. If we look at the pressure temperature chart for 410A, and we look at the pressure measurement we are taking, it says 365 PSIG. For 410A, this correlates to a 110 degree condensing temperature. So we come out of the compressor superheated, say 170, 180 degrees. We cool down to 110. With that level of pressure pushing the vapor together, it no longer has enough energy to stay a, a vapor, so it condenses to a liquid. Eventually, after it gives up enough heat, it is 100% liquid. And it will then continue to cool down a bit before it leaves the condenser. 
So the majority of that heat is done in the vapor to liquid condensing stage. The subcooling is there when you have enough liquid or enough refrigerant charge to ensure that you can have liquid leaving the condenser. There's enough refrigerant to fill the condenser to allow you to have liquid in it. When you have a low charge, there isn't enough liquid there to fully fill up the condenser. You end up with saturated vapor bubbles coming out with it. And that's why we'll say we have flash gas or vapor in the liquid line. On certain systems, let's start with simple systems. That'll be the first one we look at, i.e. piston systems and AC. They are a simple orifice, a hole. And the amount of flow that goes through a particular orifice is determined by the pressure differential. Now, as you add refrigerant, the pressure differential increases between the high and low side. And this causes more refrigerant to flow through the piston. And of course, on hot days, you have a higher outdoor temperature. So charging a correct amount is just as key, if not more key, for fixed orifice systems than it is for TXD systems. Because if you overcharge a system with a piston, you greatly increase the chance of having what you see below happen. And this is liquid return to the compressor. It doesn't matter if it's a scroll, a recip, or anything else. If you get liquid coming back to it on a regular basis, it will seize and you will destroy it. The liquid is not what destroyed that scroll. What happened was the liquid dry cleaned the bearing and the bearing seized. Now, the mobile scroll has a very large counterweight on it, and it's just not going to stop all at once. So when that bearing seized, that counterweight and the mobile scroll just kept going and it wrapped itself up in the fixed uh, scroll and broke itself all the heck. As you can see there, it looked like it literally exploded. So proper charging, and if you want to look at one third of the compressor sitting in a warranty pile that looked like this, it is a real problem. So it costs the industry and it costs contractors, it costs wholesalers, it costs everybody a lot of money again and it's something that is completely under the control of the person doing the charging all right so before you add refrigerant all right and this we're really looking at determining if you need a change in refrigerant charge but regardless you have to make sure of certain things before you start adding charge mainly because if you are topping up or adjusting a system charge you really want to make sure you cover all your bases before you do so because an incorrect refrigerant charge is very dangerous to a system and again since most of these systems are overcharged and we see there is a lot of warranty failures or a lot of failures in the field a lot of them due to refrigerant floodback these two are definitely related number one make sure you clear the area around the outdoor coil. The airflow through this coil, like you know, I talked about at the start, directly determines your condensing temperature or has a huge influence on your condensing temperature. So as you can see in the blurb at the bottom, just clearing out the trees and bushes and crap around this thing, the jungle that was growing there, we noticed a substantial drop in condensing temperature. Now, picture a simple restriction like a piston. If you're operating on a hot day and you don't have a lot of superheat to start with and you have poor airflow that's pushing your condensing temperature up even higher, you are now in floodback zone. And guess what? If you happen to add extra refrigerant to this system, you also boosted the condensing temperature 5 or 10 degrees on top of that. So now you're really in hot water as far as flooding that compressor. So this is a key step make sure you have clearance and good airflow around the condensed unit. I've seen all kinds of people plant stuff and put fences around these things because they don't want anybody to see them. Well, unfortunately, they may not look great, but they need to breathe properly. So you need that clearance around them. On the indoor coil, if you're going to do this, uh, check airflow, make sure all of your 
diffusers and dampers and whatnot are open so you have proper airflow and follow a recognized procedure, whether it is total external static or one that I prefer that will actually give you a value is determining your velocity pressure with uh, um, a total pressure manometer. And then you can get your velocity from that, multiply it times the area of the ductwork, and you have your exact CFM. If you know your exact CFM, it is very easy then to determine if it's correct or not, right? It matches what the manufacturer recommends, but also even as an aside, it can tell you how that system is performing. Remember, the amount of refrigerant in the evaporator determines the average coil temperature of that evaporator. The warmer the evaporator is, the less moisture it's going to remove and the more sensible cooling it's going to do. And you have this process here. In school, we call this a sensible heat ratio, but it's a fancy term for determining the difference between latent and sensible heat. But the key point is this, if you're running 280 CFM a ton, that probably isn't correct. So if you are icing up a coil and you're running at 28 degrees evaporating temperature, yeah, I would probably look at that airflow as a correction first before I started dumping a whole bunch of refrigerant in there, which by the way, is not gonna evaporate because you don't have the airflow across the coil. So, you know, it sounds funny and it sounds silly, but it happens way too often. The flip side of this is if somebody says that their house is damp all the time and they're in a high latent area, they got a high wet bulb inside and they're running 480, 500 CFM a ton and the air is just wailing through everything, then yeah, chances are that's a problem as well. So it gives you an idea of where the airflow is. If it is correct, now your measurements are going to mean something. If it's not correct, you need to correct it ahead of time. And yes, I understand this is easier said than done, but unfortunately it is a 100% reality. If you do not correct airflow, you are never gonna have a system that operates the way it's supposed to. And adding refrigerant charge is not going to solve that. So you're starting out, you're gonna charge this system. And at the same time, you're gonna replace something like a dead compressor or something. All right, so you gotta pull the refrigerant out of the system. If you have this opportunity, and it is an opportunity, weigh the refrigerant that you recover out of the system. And if possible, use a one-shot or one-time recovery jug. And these are great because there is nothing in them. So when you use them, they are gonna be 100% filled with whatever the refrigerant was in the system. And assuming that it is exactly what it's supposed to be, when you take it back to the wholesaler, they don't have to worry about having 18 different types of refrigerant in there and having to distill them all. And yeah, they're never happy about that. And usually you don't get your money back. So the other key point here is, if you have a charge, a weighed charge listed on the nameplate and you pull out substantially less than that preferred amount of refrigerant, there's a pretty good chance that that is one of the key issues. If you are short on charge and you burn up a compressor, they are usually going hand in hand because low charge ends up with high superheat, high discharge pressures and temperatures and burned up windings and, um, and, and bearings. So this just gives you an idea of what was going on in the system beforehand. And once again, if you're short on refrigerant, where the hell did it go? right did the person undercharge it ahead of time probably not right so you need to ask yourself okay where is this leak i need to find it all right especially if it's a slower leak that's not going to become extremely obvious like you know a screwdriver puncture in the evaporator or something then you may have to go through and use a micron gauge nitrogen and things like that just to ensure that you find that leak and correct it so once again, just to reiterate, that refrigerant charge that you pull out gives you a great indication of how the system or what could be affecting the system before you got there and possible cause for failure. It saves you a lot of time. Second thing is, you want just refrigerant and oil in there. You know, and I'll leave it at that. 
And if you have non-condensables or moisture, that's a problem. Non-condensables is not that hard to get out of the system unless it's being trapped in there by a solenoid valve or a valve that you forgot to open up or whatever it happens to be. Usually you can get most of the non-condensables out of there pretty quick. It is the moisture that is a problem. And here's the unfortunate part. If you're lucky enough to work in a place where it is hot and not very humid outside, this becomes much easier. And you may ask, what the heck does humidity have to do with it? Well, the warmer the temperature of the air, the amount of moisture it can hold goes up almost exponentially. So if you have the compressor laying around with open connections and it's 95 degrees outside and humid, you're gonna dump a whole lot of moisture in there, which negates the, the benefit of evacuation when it's a higher temperature. The reason is, is that if you wanna boil water at 104 degrees, you can do it at a much higher pressure then you can boil it at 45 degrees. To start evaporating that moisture at 45 or 40 degrees requires a much lower vacuum level. So if you're gonna do it right, use a micron gauge. Leave the manifold gauges in the truck, use a micron gauge, three eighths inch hoses are larger, larger, and a core removal tool. There's lots of videos on YouTube that show you how to do this, and they will show you how much time you save, and it is a ton of time you're gonna save doing this. Plus, you'll get the right um, the evacuation done. So you'll not only have peace of mind, you'll save yourself a ton of time. Also, it's pretty easy to find leaks because if the pressure goes up and plateaus, you have moisture. If it goes up and keeps going up, you have a leak. So it's pretty easy to find. Just pressurize it with a bit of nitrogen and go find a leak or whatever your preferred method happens to be. The reason I mentioned dry nitrogen is dry nitrogen should be in everybody's toolbox. If you're not using that dry nitrogen to purge the system before you evacuate, you are really missing the boat. Why? Because moisture is the only way to make acid in a PoE system. You can burn the crap out of a system, but unless you have moisture in there, you're really not going to produce acid. But as soon as you add moisture, you're going to produce acid here regardless. So, Dry nitrogen has incredibly low vapor pressure as far as moisture is concerned. And it will scavenge and sponge moisture out of the oil extremely quickly and very effectively. So by purging with dry nitrogen, you are going to save yourself a ton of time versus trying to do it through dehydration with a vacuum pump. And remember, when you see copper coloring there, that tells you that there was a catalytic action going on and that moisture and acid were present in the system. The rest of that black stuff is just broken down, winding insulation and oil. Okay, so before charging, and again, this kind of looks at charging as in correcting a perceived um, deficiency in charge. In other words, trying to fix a low charge, what you think is a low charge, or what comes across or presents itself as a low charge. First thing to do, and don't laugh at this, verify your metering device capacity. Why do I say this? Because I get a lot of wholesalers, I work with a lot of wholesalers that get expansion valves back, they're not feeding properly, blah, 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 and guess what? When you compare the capacity of the valve to the capacity of the unit cooler, it is undersized. Well, it says one ton on the valve, yeah, one ton at 40 degrees. But if you're running an ice cream cooler at, or freezer at minus 20, that one ton valve gives you 6,000 BTUs an hour, half a ton at minus 20. So if your unit cooler is one ton at minus 20, you're probably going to need a two ton valve to match it. So always select your metering device based on evaporator capacity at the application temperature. Don't assume that just because it's a one ton valve on the box, it is gonna give you 12,000 BTUs at whatever temperature you decide to operate it at. That is not how it works. It's the same as a compressor. So selecting them for AC is easy because everything operates at the nominal temperature or pretty close to it in AC. However, once you go to refrigeration, you have to take a few extra steps. Now here's the thing, a undersized TXV will give you a low evaporator pressure long pull down times and high superheat, just like a 
low charge system will. However, the key difference is going to be the condenser subcooling. If you have condenser subcooling, six, seven, eight degrees or whatever, you are not low on charge. I don't care what your evaporator pressure and temperature is, you are not low on charge. Somewhere there is a interference in getting that refrigerant into the evaporator. Your job is to figure out why. And an undersized TXV is a good place to start. Why? Because it takes a little bit of time, seconds even, to verify it, right? As opposed to going through and doing a ton of work just to come back and realize that, hey, I just did all this for nothing. All I could have done was replace the orifice in the TXV with the next size up and life would have been good. So again, it sounds funny, but it happens way too often. The other thing that kind of makes you scratch your head is when I cover technical support on the phone and I feel sorry for these guys because I am the first person to admit I would do something like this, all right? Is when you have a system open, there's a glut or a ton of benefits to replacing a piston with a TXV. You'll get better um, evaporator fill across a broad range of temperatures. You'll get much better dehumidification due to low, lower average evaporator coil. You'll save 20, 30% on energy use all across the board. However, you absolutely 100% have to remove that piston when you put the TXV in. Two meter devices in series isn't better than one necessarily. In this case, it definitely isn't. So never leave it in there. I have a rule that when I leave the job, I always have this thing in a particular pocket, my front left pocket. I always check it before I leave the property. And if it's not in there, I have a damn heart attack and I go and find out. Usually I just left it somewhere, but seriously, I have got several calls on technical support where this has happened and it is a real pain in the butt. By the way, you'll see the distributor down there. That's why 100% of these AC valves that you see with the distributor, 100% of them are external equalized. Always use an external equalized valve and always make sure you connect the external equalized connection at the outlet of the evaporator, preferably downstream of the sensing bulb. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll get a question on that. Another reason for choosing a scale to charge a system, a lot of people don't know this, but if you work on split systems, systems with remote condensers and evaporators. And I've seen some doozies where you have a seven eighth inch liquid line that practically runs off to the horizon. Compressors have a maximum refrigerant charge. If you go above that, it is necessary in order to protect the compressor to utilize a suction line accumulator and a crankcase heater in the off cycle. Why? Because the refrigerant charge is so great that even with a manual compressor that uses a discharge line to heat the, uh, the, the oil sump, you have enough refrigerant that you can literally fill the entire compressor up and dump it straight into the intake valves at the top of the compressor. So really you're gonna destroy it in this case. With the um, scroll, you are going to immerse that upper bearing in the refrigerant and you are going to dry clean it. So if your charge exceeds a certain amount, it is highly recommended that you need to use a um, suction line accumulator and a crankcase heater. One other thing, this is also a good indication and a, and a value that you can use in the um, application guideline to determine if you need to add more refrigerant charge. So again, this image you see here on the right was taken directly out of our install application guide. All right, so let's look at the effects of ambient and load conditions and what they mean to you when you charge a system. So now we are charging a system, let's say it's a new system and you've got your install booklet out and you took the plastic away from it and you are reading it and inside of that you will see a chart that tells you exactly how much refrigerant you need to add based on superheat. And it uses the outdoor and indoor conditions to determine the superheat value you're gonna use. Why the outdoor conditions? Again, 
the temperature outside determines your condensing temperature and your condensing temperature determines your pressure. And the pressure difference between the condenser and the evaporator determines how much flow goes through that piston. Nothing else for a given size piston, the amount of pressure differential, as long as you have a solid column of liquid, determines how much flow goes through it. So as you add refrigerant and you fill the system up, the pressures go up. And as your condensing pressure rises quickly, right, you will increase flow through the piston and drop your superheat. So here we have a pseudotypical generic charging chart. If you've ever charged a system with a piston or even a cap tube, you should recognize these. On the left, you're going to have your outdoor ambient temperatures. Inside, you have your wet bulb. Why wet bulb? <laughs> well, unlike refrigeration, you really don't cool your house down that much. You might start at 75 degrees, you turn it off at maybe 72. So you drop the temperature three degrees, big whipty thrill. But what you did do was you probably pulled a ton of moisture out of the air. So if it's 75 or 77 degrees inside and it's 68 wet bulb, there's a hell of a lot more energy in the air than if it's 62 wet bulb. Okay, that means the air is much drier and contains less energy. So by picking an outdoor temperature and comparing it to the different wet bulb temperatures, you can see two things. One, how the system performs much better at higher outdoor temperatures. And number two, how you're quickly gonna run into problems on cooler days outside. And let's say it's raining like heck outside, you've got a ton of moisture at 75 degrees and it's 100% RH outside, but you're trying to dehumidify the house and it's 68 wet bulb inside you end up with 24 degrees of superheat. That's a problem. So you saw, heard me mention TXVs. TXVs would take that, that superheat and probably knock seven or eight degrees off it easily. And this may allow us much better dehumidification. So I said, why would this chart not work in high dry climates? It's designed for the Northeast, why, or the, or the East Coast, why? Well, it's hundred degrees outside and you live in Arizona and it is bone dry and you have a indoor dry bulb of 64 degrees. Well, you'll notice that at 64 degrees and 100 degrees outside, you have a flat line. That is your compressor, it's dead. All right, because that means you have no superheat and you are flooding your compressor. So anything you see on the left bottom left corner here is not allowable in this system. So the, these pistons do not regulate, do not optimize refrigerant flow. They're just a hole. Again, their Achilles heel is they do not adapt to load changes or indoor outdoor temperature changes. All right. So you'll notice once again, this is universal that on hot days, your superheat drops. So if you overcharge a system, and you overcharge a system such that you are taking a 95 degree condenser at uh, 64 dry bulb or 64 wet bulb, and you're turning it into a 105 degree condenser. Now you've got a problem because you have driven up the pressure in your high side by adding more refrigerant. You have lots of refrigerant flowing into the evaporator if you don't have enough heat load in the air to evaporate it, you are now flooding the compressor. The same thing I told him, talked about removing the vegetation around the condenser. Well, same idea. If you're running a 95 degree condenser, but you're adding 12 degrees to it because of poor airflow, you're now at 107 degrees. You can see here where you can get pretty low superheat values and a possibility of flooding the compressors add that over half the systems are overcharged and you can see where this is going. Subcooling. Now there is a misconception out there that larger condensers will give you more subcooling. This is absolutely 100% incorrect. A larger condenser will give you a lower condensing temperature because the refrigerant can be closer to the air temperature. However, what determines the value of subcooling is very, very simple. It is the temperature difference between the refrigerant and the air or the refrigerant, the water, whatever you wanna, you're using to cool it. So 
on a small condenser, on an overcharged system, on a dirty condenser or one with poor airflow, you're going to have much higher condensing temperatures compared to the air temperature, and you're going to have much higher subcooling value. But again, this is only with PXV. If you have a piston, you are going to end up with the exact opposite system situation. You're going to end up with much lower subcooling if you have a plugged or dirty condenser or whatever, because you are going to be driving all the refrigerant into the evaporator and starving the condenser. So the absolute opposite thing is going to happen, and it is determined by whether you have a fixed orifice like a piston or whether you have a, an adaptable uh, metering device like a TXV. That is why soup subcooling is such a good indicator of charge when it comes to dealing with TXV. So increasing the charge of refrigerant in a system will increase your subcooling and your pressure. So on the right, we got a low charge around 104 degrees. We got 97 degrees of, of, of liquid temperature. We're running around seven degrees of, of, of subcooling. That's really not a low charge, probably three or four degrees would be, but fair enough. On the left side, we're running 110 degrees. We've increased our spread by six degrees and we're running a 96 degree condensing temperature. That gives us 14 degrees of subcooling, which is a lack of subcooling. Unless this is a very specific situation, there's a good chance we are probably overcharged. All right, finally, here is the charging chart for TXVs. Now, before 2007 and SEER 13 dragged itself out, almost all AC residential systems were pistons. And when SEER 13 came out, that pretty much changed overnight. And a ton of TXV systems were going out Nobody knew about subcooling, and it was pretty much a disaster at the start. However, the industry has come around to it, the information is available, and here you can see a charging chart for use with a TXV. So, you add refrigerant charge, and we got 105 degrees circled here, I like high temperatures apparently, 67 wet bulb inside, and we are gonna charge at the intersection of these two, to a pressure of approximately 420 pounds and 11 degrees of subcooling. Now, here's the thing. This is a SEER 13 unit that I pulled some of this data from. If you're dealing with a high efficiency system like a SEER 16 system that has ginormous condensers, then this is not going to be 420 PSI and 11 degrees of subcooling. The chart for that high efficiency unit will probably say something closer to 390 or 395 and like eight degrees or seven degrees. Why? Because the refrigerant temperature is much closer to the air temperature in a high efficiency system. And if you remember our rule, that means that your subcooling values are going to be less. So your condensing pressure and subcooling values are gonna be lower, hence the energy savings. So do not take a picture of this with your phone and use it as a universal charging master for every unit out there because they are very specific to individual units. Every efficiency unit will have its own charging chart. So please keep that in mind, very important. And remember, this is a fine balance point. So charging to this means you have the correct amount of refrigerant. You don't need to add a bit extra just for safety measures or just because it has a receiver. The receiver they put on these systems these days are getting smaller and smaller to save money. A lot of times they'll just flip the filter dryer up on its size, stretch it a bit, and they'll put a combo um, or combi uh, receiver filter dryer in. Yeah, it holds like an extra four ounces or something, right? So always charge to these values because if it's a high efficiency system, the efficiency drops off very quickly on either side of this point. All right, so kind of just reiterated what I said there. Sight glasses. All right, so sight glasses are your best friend on remote systems, whether it's a scroll or whether it is a recip. The sight glass is going to tell you a couple of things. Number one, it's going to tell you your oil level. All right, you don't want your oil turning into an electrical problem when you're shocked when it actually comes back. All right. If you have long piping runs and risers and heat reclaim coils and all kinds of other stuff, 
expect to have to adjust your oil charge. Now here's the fun part. The oil charge recommendations and how much extra to add is actually a lot of times in the compressor literature. It is in our MTZ or Manrup and our performer scrolls. They will tell you that based on a certain amount of piping and refrigerant charge, you need to add this much more oil. And of course, you wanna look in your sight glass. If the oil is visible in the middle two thirds of the sight glass, you're good to go. It is going to fluctuate up and down. It is never gonna stay steady, all right? However, if it is within that range, you have a proper oil charge. If you can't see it, you don't know if it's too low or too high, all right? That, both of those are a problem. The second one is if you see foam. If it is white and it is completely foamed up, that tells you you don't have enough superheat. And if you remember from our last presentation, the saturated suction superheat has to be above a certain value. If you have foam in your sump, you are not lubricating your bearings, especially in a scroll. So if you have foam in the bearing, your compressor is not going to have, or sorry, foam in the cyclops, your compressor is not going to have a long life expectancy, all right? So again, this is really um, something to pay attention to. All right, and once again, weigh in that charge to know how much you put in there. Why? Because when you're doing these things, you should have documentation for it. In other words, you should have a worksheet, whether you're doing a startup of commissioning or you're doing troubleshooting, um, service work, or even PM, and you put all this information in there. Why? Because if something goes south down the road, you have proof that you did what you were supposed to do. So if somebody comes around and says, this thing was never charged correctly to begin with, you're gonna show him the refrigerant charge you put in, the subcooling values you measured, and on and on and on, and that is your evidence. And I have had to do this in the past. I am 100% honest with you here. And it saved my butt because if there is problems, this documentation is gonna help you an awful lot down the road. Not to mention the fact that you're also guaranteeing that the system is charged correctly. All right, so what can cause problems and mask itself as a refrigerant charge issue but really is not a refrigerant charge issue. And what I'm trying to get at is here, before you check these things out we're gonna cover, do not add charge, all right? Number one, this one's sneaky. You have a plug filter dryer, a stuck solenoid valve, or somebody forgot to fully open a ball valve upstream of the TXV. Well, these things, can all work to ruin your day. Why? Because they can cause a pressure drop and flash gas. And the orifice inside a TXV is very tiny. So trying to put flash gas through there is like trying to shove a piece of PVC through the eye of a needle. It ain't gonna go, right? So what ends up happening is you get very low evaporator pressure, you get fluctuations in temperature, and you're gonna get low evaporator suction temperature and very high superheat values. And these are pretty easy to solve if you think about it, right? Remember electrical issues in college? You got 24 volts at the control transformer, zero at the compressor, uh, relay coil. What do you do? You figure out what is open to cause the voltage drop. Here, you're looking at what is closed or what is plugged that's causing the pressure drop. A lot of times, your hands and your ears and your eyes will solve this for you grabbing either side of a filter dryer or a valve that's squealing away and sweating on one side will quickly tell you if it is plugged or not, okay? Adding refrigerant is not gonna help you here. If you've got subcooling leaving your condenser, eight degrees in this case, you are not undercharged, all right? So don't add charge until you check these kinds of things, Because right? you're not gonna solve the problem. All you're gonna do is drive your head pressure up until such time as you either go off on overload or God help you, you dislodge whatever's plugging something up here and you end up flooding the compressor. So either way, it's not really a solution. Other thing, downstream. Let's say you've checked all upstream and you've got a solid column of subcooled liquid at your TXV, but it's just not feeding it into the evaporator. So now what? Well, first thing you can do is try this all right if you've eliminated all other possible causes adjust your superheat 
And if you're underfeeding, adjust it downwards. If you're overfeeding, adjust it upwards. Also check your sensing bulb and make sure it is mounted correctly and insulated. This is very important, all right? With a metallic strap, not with duct tape or a zip tie or something like that. If it conducts electricity, it conducts heat. Keep that in mind. So if you adjust superheat and everything else is okay, it's just a superheat setting, the valve will react immediately. Yes, you need to wait 10 or 15 minutes for the system to stabilize, but as soon as you adjust that superheat spindle, the valve's either gonna open and close and you're gonna increase or decrease the flow in the evaporator immediately. So if you do a couple of cranks on the superheat spindle and nothing happens, it tells you one of two things. Number one, you've lost your bulb charge. Or number two, the valve is plugged internally. Now, the next thing to do is hold that bulb in your hand. The warmth of your hand will drive the pressure of the sensing bulb up and will drive the valve open. It may be enough to unstick the valve. It also tells you if you have a bulb charge or not. If you get no response, then you have to pull that valve out. And when you do, if the valve has a removable screen on the orifice, check it for debris. Even if it doesn't, look at the inlet of the valve. There will be a screen at the inlet of the liquid inlet side. If it is plugged with crap, that tells you what the problem probably is. You also got to ask yourself why the filter dryer didn't get it, unless it's like 300 yards away. All right, you might want to move it closer, but that tells you the issue. My recommendations for what are worth, obviously, you know, follow proper startup procedure, replace the filter dryer and flush the system because I can almost guarantee you, you have not caught all of it. All right. It's just peace of mind to make sure the system's clean so that the investment you're making in this system is going to pay off down the road. All right. All right. Remember bulb strap. You have this sensing bulb that's only touching a little bit of the pipe. The rest of it exposed. So wrap it with a piece of copper or other conductive material. Some people like our bulb strap, some people don't. You know something? I'm okay if you don't like our bulb strap. I think it's great. Made it a copper, looks good, it conducts heat like crazy. However, as long as you use a metallic strap and you strap that bulb so it's almost or even making a little dimple in the pipe, don't flatten it. So it's very hard to move and you wrap it with that sticky tape that pulls all the hair off your knuckles, right? It sticks everything but what you want it to, you will end up with zero influence on that valve, so that valve uh, sensing bulb, other than what is going on inside of the pipe. All right, and that is exactly what you want. I have seen situations where we were flooding compressors and you get there, and these are outdoor chillers, and the sensing bulbs hanging out in the sun, right? And you wonder, well, how could somebody not have caught this? Well, they didn't. Right, and it's flooding the compressor. Very simple fix. Unfortunately, it cost ten thousand dollars to get there at this point, but it was a pretty simple fix. So always, always keep this stuff in mind. The other thing is rules of thumb. All right, people ask me, Jamie, where do you put the sensing bulb? They may not like my answer. I say, put it where the oil is not going to be. Right? You know, yes, you can say three o'clock, nine o'clock. That's great. These rules of thumb until they don't work. Right? Because you're in a particular situation. You should know by looking at a system where the oil is going to be, all right? Think of your car. You put a coffee cup on the dashboard of your car. You crank the wheel. Where's the coffee cup going to go? To the outside of the turn, right? Well, that's the same as the oil. It's going to sling around that bend there after the header to the outside. It's going to sling to the bottom of that pipe. Now, this is a bit of a Goldilocks thing here. You have lots of room to put it. However, if this wasn't available, where else could you put this thing? Well, you would put it on the angled piece of pipe coming down above it on the far side, which would be opposite of where the oil would be. So always put it where the oil is not going to be and you're a winner. And once again, insulate it, all right? It doesn't kill you to insulate it. Do that unless, unless you are specified otherwise by the manufacturer because there is the odd instance where they do not insulate sensing bulbs, but they're usually in heat pumps and they're very specific OEM TXVs. With aftermarket TXVs that are universal, always insulate them. Another thing, 
is airflow. We talked about airflow before. Why was it important? Well, take a look at this. Here you have an evaporator with proper airflow. It's got a good load on it. It's running 22 degrees at the cooler, 11 degrees of superheat. Your TXV is throttled about 60, 70% open. And at the bottom left, you got seven degrees of subcooling. Everything's great. On the right, here's the issue, all right? You have reduced airflow. So what happens? Well, your evaporator pressure drops. Why is your evaporator pressure drop? Well, because the TXV throttles closed because it realizes there's too much refrigerant in the, in the evaporator for the low load, so it starts to throttle close. Less mass flow in the evaporator, your evaporator pressure has to drop so that the compressor balances pumping capacity. They all tie together. But notice something, your evaporator superheats nine degrees. That is two degrees above the opening superheat on a lot of TXVs. So this TXV might be 10, 15% open. And notice the bottom, you got eight degrees of subcooling. You've got a full condenser. This is not a refrigerant charge issue. Yes, you've got a low evaporator temperature, but you've also got low superheat. Now, let's flip it. Let's look at a situation where you have a, both a low evaporator temperature, but you have not only high superheat, but you also have low subcooling. So in this case with a TXV, think about what's happening. You got lots of load, you just don't have enough refrigerant in the evaporator to match that load. That's where the 21 degrees of superheat comes from. But hold on, that in itself only tells you about the evaporator. You don't have enough refrigerant in the evaporator. It doesn't tell you about the rest of the system, right? Remember, you could have a plug filter dryer, ball valve, you could have a plug TXV, an undersized TXV. All of these issues will give you a low evaporator temperature and a high, ev a low evaporator temperature and high evaporator superheat. However, the clincher that will tell you it's a refrigerant charge issue is the subcooling. If you've got zero or some stupidly low value for superheat, like 0.8 degrees or one degree or something like that, and unless it's like really weird situation, you do not have enough refrigerant and you probably have flash gas at your metering device. And not only is your evaporator temperature 12 degrees, but it's also fluctuating as well. A lot of you guys will see this in AC systems if it's undercharged and has a TXV, you will get fluctuating pressures. And that's another sign that you are not having enough refrigerant injected into the evaporator because you have flash gas at your metering device. So all three of these, have to be taken together before you can ascertain whether you have a refrigerant charge problem or not. Low evaporator temperature on its own isn't enough. High evaporator superheat on its own isn't enough. That only tells you the evaporator. The low subcooling is what does it. Finally, look at this. You're gonna make a superheat adjustment. That's great because every valve that I've come across I haven't seen one yet where clockwise increases superheat, counterclockwise decreases superheat, right? So clockwise will close the valve, counterclockwise will open it. But here's the fun part. Not every valve reacts the same way. Our TR6 valves, AC valves, 410A, one degree per turn. So you turn this whole thing 365 degrees, or 360 degrees, I guess, sorry, confusing the years and circles, and you get one degree of change. A T2 valve, on the other hand, is seven degrees per turn, seven times as fast. So if you don't check what is going to happen, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to be sitting there all day wondering what's going on, or all hell is going to break loose, and you're going to wonder what happened. So always make sure you know the rate of change, and make sure you set specify to the manufacturer's recommendation, and you wait in between, all right? Also, write down how many changes you made, how much change, and in what direction and the time you did it. Because here's what could happen, and I'll leave this with you. When you reduce superheat, and there's something plugging that valve, you are increasing the pressure difference, the force difference between opening and closing. And it may just be enough of a difference to dislodge whatever crud is plugging the valve. If that's the case, it was never a superheat problem to begin with, and you need to go back and put it exactly where it was. If you've written it down, that's easy. If it's not, now you got some work ahead of you. So 
take it from me, save yourself some time. Always note whatever change you do, all right? Thank you for your time. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. All right, uh, let's open things up to some questions. Appreciate uh, everyone who submitted one. So, Jamie, if you're ready, we can uh, dive right in. Yeah, let's do it. First question is, what effect does the sun have versus having the airflow? Sun. Well, it's funny you should mention that. Um, the first time we did a data logger. Now, a data logger is one of these fancy things where you put a bunch of pressure and temperature sensors on a unit and you watch how it operates through the day. And the sensitivity of this data logger was so high that we could literally tell when the cloud passed in front of the sun, because you would see that half a degree, three quarter degree drop in temperature on the high side. I'm not making this up. Now, having said that, it is not something that you really can control. The air side has a much larger effect. If you don't believe me, to shade your condensing unit for a while, then take the shade away and see what happens. Next, stop the airflow on the condensing unit and see what happens. I can tell you that stopping the airflow is gonna have a hundred times larger effect than the sun. It doesn't help if you have poor airflow and you're overcharged and your condensing unit is painted flat black, right? Yes, it is going to have some issues, but it's only going to exasperate other issues. If the unit has good airflow and is sized correctly and everything else is fine, the sun is not going to have that huge of an impact, at least from what I've seen in my experience. Okay, um, next question might be our last. I'm just taking a look at the time here. Uh, no, do you no. have a rule of thumb when adding additional charge, like a 25 ton condensing unit that comes dry charged? Uh, that's a tough one. It's not as simple as just um, a rule of thumb. Here's why. Because you could have two 25 ton condensing units. How far is everything else going to be? What are the other components in it? I'm not making this up. Like having a filter dryer, a larger filter dryer, you know, a couple sizes up will throw off your refrigerant charge of these big systems but a lot. Okay. Also, the size of the receiver varies heavily between different units. One, you could have an eight pound re receiver. The next, you could have a 12 or 20 pound receiver. You know, if the system is designed for low ambient conditions where you're backing refrigerant up into the condenser and you're storing it in the receiver in the summertime, your condenser could be huge, right? So, all of these things need to be taken into account. I'm sorry, I don't really have an answer for you. I wish it was so simple that I could. If somebody else does, great, but I would be very leery of anything that doesn't have calculations to back it up. That's why I always say, please, if possible, go with what the manufacturer recommends based on pipe length, component internal volume, and everything else. I know it's a lot of work, I get it, I've been there. But off the top of my head, I can't think of any other alternative at this point that I would feel safe to tell you anyway. Okay, well, thank you uh, for answering those questions. Uh, if, you know, we apologize if we did not get to your question, Jamie will be taking some time to answer the rest of all the questions we received um, on our Twitter accounts at Danfoss Cool US. So uh, thank you, Jamie. And again, thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. As you can see on the thank screen you. here. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, as you can see on the screen here, we encourage you all to connect with both Jamie and Dan Foss for more e-learning opportunities, videos, tips, tricks, and tools. Jamie will be hosting several more webinars over the next few weeks, so please visit danfoss.us and scroll down to the latest news to sign up for those as well. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, uh, we are recording today's webinar. So for the recording of today and past webinars, uh, please visit our YouTube channel, Danfoss Cool US, and uh, thank you and have a great rest of your day. See you, folks. Thanks.